ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد Tonight then insha'Allah ta'ala we're going to be starting a new series of lessons and these lessons are going to be in the topic of fiqh going through all of the different aspects of worship of tahara purification of prayer, of fasting, of zakat, of hajj, of buying and selling and transactions, various different topics within worship. We're going to be studying the fiqh of all of those different chapters. And the book we are going to use to go through all of those chapters will be the book of Al-Allama Abdul Rahman Al-Sa'idi Rahimahullah Ta'ala Manhaju Salikin A book called Manhaju Salikin And this is a book that goes through all of the different aspects of fiqh in a brief and summarized way and that's why the scholars they advise this book as a beginner's book in fiqh as one of the easy starting books to learn the different rulings on fiqh so the author as we mentioned is abu abdillah abdul rahman ibn nasir Ibn Abdullah Al-Sa'di Rahimahullah Ta'ala He is one of the scholars who passed away now Passed away some years ago In the last century Very recently And he was one of the famous and well-known scholars In Saudi Arabia And many of the scholars who were alive now or recently alive, they studied with a Sheikh Abdul Rahman al Saudi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And he has various other books as well. One of the famous ones is the book in Tafsir. There is a brief and summarized book in Tafsir. Written by a Sheikh Abdul Rahman al Saudi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And that is also a book that the scholars advise with in terms of understanding basic tafsir of the Quran because it is simplified and easy on all of the chapters and ayat. So there is much more that could be said regarding the biography of this great scholar, but will suffice with that brief amount in order to be able to begin with the actual book itself. This book, Manhaj As-Salikin of Al-Shaykh Abdul Rahman Al-Sa'di Rahimahullah Ta'ala. So the beginning section, does anybody want to read? Go on then. Out loud. Uh, here we can't really do Come here. Go and do it. If you have the Arabic, sit down there maybe. Then follow along with the Arabic here. <laughs> no, before that, the introduction. Oh, anybody practice the introduction? Oh, go on. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم 
الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب إليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم أما بعد فهذا كتاب مختصر في الفقه جمعت فيه بين المسائل والدلائل واقتصرت فيه على أهم الأمور وأعدمها نفعا لشدة الضرور ضرورية إلى هذا الموضوع لشدة الضرورة لشدة الضرورة إلى هذا الموضوع وكثيرا ما اختصر على النفس إذا كان الحكم فيه واضحا لسهولة حفظه وفهمه على المبتدئين لأن العلم معرفة الحق بدليله والفقه معرفة الأحكام الشرعية الفرعية بأدلتها من الكتاب والسنة والإجماء والقياس صحيح وأقتصر على الأدلة المشهورة خوفا من التطويل وإذا كانت المسألة, وإذا كانت المسألة خلافية اقتصرت على القول الذي ترجح عندي تبعا للأدلة الشرعية الأحكام الأحكام الخمسة الواجب وهو ما أثيب ثاعل وعنقب تارك والحرام ضده والمكروه وهو ما أثيب تارك ولم يعاقب فاعله والمسنون ضده والمباح الذي فعله وتركه على حد سواء ويجب على المكلف أن يتعلم من الفقه كل ما يحتاج إليه في عباداته ومعاملاته وغيرها قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من يرد الله به خيرا يفقه في الدين متفق عليه So in the opening section of the book the author says Alhamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruh wa natubu ilayh wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa sayyi'ati a'malina man yahdillahu fala mudilla lah wa man yudlil fala hadiya lah وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم You'll notice that introduction that the Sheikh began with is basically the same as what? خطبة الحاجة that you hear every جمعة that there is almost the same as khutbatul haja not exactly the same but almost the same so that indicates that the shaykh did not intend to start with the exact khutbatul haja but he began with something similar with the meanings indicating something similar and there are a couple of words that are different. For example, وَنَتُوبُ إِلَيْهِ That would not normally be in the khutbatul haja. So this is not the actual khutbatul haja, but the shaykh, he began with wording that is almost identical as an introduction to the book. And then he says, أَمَّا بَعْد أَمَّا بَعْد You'll see that phrase often in the Arabic books or when scholars are giving a lecture and they say Amma Ba'd. And basically that is a phrase in Arabic that is used to indicate a transference from one thing to another. You are moving from one idea to another, from one part to another, 
from one thing to another. So he's given us a brief introduction, then he's now moving on from that to the introduction about the book itself. So Amma Ba'd is a phrase indicating a transfer from one idea to another, one section to another. So then he says, فَهَذَا كِتَابٌ مُخْتَصَرٌ فِي الْفِقْ This is a summarized book in fiqh. جَمَعَتُ فِيهِ بَيْنَ الْمَسَائِلِ وَالدَّلَائِلِ He says, I have combined within it, in this summarized book of fiqh, I have combined within it al-masail, the various issues, the various topics, all of the different topics we're going to come across, wiping on the socks and purific, all the different things, the masail, the different topics and issues, and al-dalail, the evidences that go with them. And so you'll notice throughout this book, his methodology is that he'll mention the mas'ala. He'll mention the particular issue at hand. For example, the wiping over the socks. The issue of wiping over the socks, for example. Then he'll give you all the evidences about that topic. And he'll do that with all of the mas'ail in this book. Gives you the mas'ala gives you the issue, the topic, and then gives you the evidences for it. So in that way, when we go through this book now, inshaAllah, you will then learn all of the different issues and topics, and you'll learn the evidences for them. Every issue has the evidence mentioned at the end of it. وَاقْتَصَرْتُ فِيهِ عَلَىٰ أَهَمِّ الْأُمُورِ He says, I uh, was succinct, or I summarized the most important fiqh affairs in this book only. Not all of the fiqh affairs, but the most important ones, meaning the fiqh issues, that the majority of people come across always. There are certain thick issues, certain things that people always ask about. What do you do with this? What do you do if that happens? What do you do if this happens? The issues that happen the most amongst people, he says, they are the ones that I have summarized into this book. As for other fiqh issues, that are less likely to occur, and they are encountered on a more uh, rare basis, then he has not mentioned those in this book. Only the fiqh issues that are most needed by the people, that are most encountered by the people. And he mentions that I've put into this book the issues that are most beneficial, لِشِدَّةِ الضُّرُورَةِ إِلَى هَذَا الْمَوْضُوعِ Due to the extreme need or the great need for this topic, because fiqh, it is a means of worshipping Allah accurately. If you do not understand fiqh, you don't understand how to do your acts of worship, then you're not going to be worshipping Allah properly in accordance to the Qur'an and the Sunnah. You need to know the fiqh. How do you do the wudu? How do you do the ghusl? How do you pray? How is the hajj? You need to know the fiqh of these affairs. So he mentions there is a great need for this. وَكَثِيرًا مَا أَقْتَصِرُ كَثِيرًا مَا أَقْتَصِرُ عَلَى النَّصِّ إِذَا كَانَ الْحُكْمُ فِيهِ وَضِحًا He says, often, I will suffice with just the text if a particular issue is clear. 
Meaning sometimes in some fiqh issues, there might be a hadith that mentions that fiqh issue. And the hadith is so obvious and clear by what it intends and the ruling from it. He says, sometimes I'll just mention that text and nothing else. Leave it at that. Because sometimes the hadith are so obvious and the rulings are so obvious, there's no need for any extra to be mentioned. So sometimes he says, I will mention the texts and just leave it at that. If the ruling is clear in those topics, لِسُهُولَةِ حِفْظِهِ وَفَهْمِهِ عَلَى الْمُبْتَدِئِينَ Due to the ease of then memorizing this and understanding it for the beginners. To make it easy to understand and to memorize this fiqh for the beginners. لِأَنَّ الْعِلْمِ because the reality of knowledge, the reality of knowledge is ma'rifatul haq bidalilah. To have knowledge of the truth, of the correct position with the evidences. And that's why the scholars, they talk about al-ilm nafi' the beneficial knowledge. Because some types of knowledge, they are not beneficial, they are harmful. Certain types of knowledge take up your time and bring you no fruits. So al-ilm nafir is the type of knowledge that a person requires and strives for. The knowledge that is beneficial for you in your religion. For this world and the afterlife, and that is to know the truth, the haq, with the evidences, and that's exactly what he does in this book. Every issue that you come across at the end of the chapter, at the end of that section, you will see he mentions the evidences. So then he says, Wal fiqh. And the meaning of al-fiqh, ma'rifatu al-ahkam al-shar'iyyati al-far'iyyati bi-adillatiha min al-kitabi wa-sunnati wal-ijma'i wal-qiyas al-sahih. This is basically a definition of fiqh. This is a definition of fiqh, that it is to know the Islamic subsidiary rulings, to know the Islamic subsidiary rulings with their evidences. And what they mean by subsidiary rulings, al-far'iyyah, what would be the opposite of that, al-asliyyah? If this fiqh, learning about purification and zakat and hajj and these affairs of worship, these are considered matters that are ahkam, shari'iyya, far'iyya, then what is the asal? Aqeedah. They consider the asliya aqeedah. And far'iyya, these affairs of fiqh. When they talk about it in this context, that's what they mean. Al-Ahkam Al-Shari'iyya Al-Far'iyya Meaning not Aqeedah Aqeedah is another affair That is another subject matter Here the subject matter is not Aqeedah It is Fiqh as we call it Regarding your worship And the different topics in the worship And how you do that worship And you have to know the rulings of this Fiqh with the evidences, with the evidences, and where do those evidences come from? He mentions four sources. The Qur'an, the Sunnah, the consensus, and Al-Qiyas. What do they call it? 
No, in English, what do you call it? Qiyas? Huh? Analogy. Analogy, but there's another word. Something more detailed than that. Deduction, analogy, al-qiyas. We will we'll get to al-qiyas briefly as well. It is when you make a comparison. For example, give an example, it will explain what qiyas is. In the Quran, does it mention anything about cocaine? No. Is there any ayah that mentions cocaine? So how do we know it's haram? How do we know it's haram? Qiyas, because in the Quran it tells you about alcohol and intoxicants that take away your mind and take away your senses. What does cocaine do? Takes away your mind, takes away your senses, intoxicates you. Therefore we can say, cocaine and these types of affairs are haram. Qiyasan, as a qiyas, as an analogy or a deduction made upon the fact a determination made upon the fact that alcohol and other intoxicants are haram in the Qur'an. So that's a qiyas, where you've got the ruling for something, the ruling is there for a particular affair. Then you have another affair, where that ruling is not mentioned by name in the Qur'an. But this affair is comparable to this one, Therefore, you can make a deduction and an analogy and place the ruling of the one which is in the Quran also upon this other one which has come up. Qiyas. So he mentions these four sources of knowledge. The Quran, the Sunnah, consensus, and this analogy and deduction, Qiyas. From those four, the reality is that they go back to two. And they are obviously the first two, because consensus and qiyas are only built upon and derived from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So the reality is the sources are two, the Qur'an and the Sunnah, the revelation. Then from those two you have the extra two, of consensus and qiyas. Consensus and qiyas are built upon what is deducted in the Quran and the Sunnah. It is not like you make a, a consensus or a qiyas upon something which has no basis in the Quran and the Sunnah. They return back to them. So the Quran and the Sunnah are the two sources and then consensus, ijma' And the analogy and deduction, the qiyas, they are two from those original two, making the four altogether. In some explanations of the scholars, when they talk about the definition of fiqh, you will hear the term al-fiqh al-akbar and al-fiqh al-asar. When they talk about it in that sense, then often Within the context of that, they mean by al-fiqh al-akbar, they mean aqidah. And then al-fiqh al-asghar, they mean by this fiqh that we are going to be studying now. Under those same chapters uh, in, in usul al-fiqh, they will talk about the faqih and the mujtahid meaning the different levels of the people when it comes to these four sources. The different levels of the people when it comes to these four sources of knowledge. There are some people who will understand the fiqh rulings by deriving them and deducting them and understanding them making the istimbat from these sources. They are the mujtahid, they are the high levels of the fuqaha. The ones who are able to look at the evidences and derive the rulings from them. That's at the higher levels of the fuqaha. Then you have the normal levels of somebody with some knowledge. They are not going to be deriving rulings. They are going to be 
understanding and memorizing the rulings from those sources that others have already derived. A person, a student now, for example, Talib al ilm a student of knowledge now, isn't going to be at the level of a mujtahid that he says, I can look at these ayat and I can derive the rulings for you. I can extrapolate the rulings from them for you. I can give you the tafsir, I can give you the fiqh, I can make the istimbat. No, you cannot. That is, they mention in the books of Usul al-Fiqh, the higher levels of the fuqaha, the mujtahidun, those who look into the evidences and they can derive the rulings. As for those who are at the normal level of knowledge or the lower levels of knowledge, the average levels of knowledge, then upon them is to understand the fiqh rulings with the evidences, and that's it. They are not at the level of deriving their own evidences. They cannot say that I have this ayah and this ayah proves X, Y, and Z from the fiqh rulings. And not a single faqih throughout the 1400 years has ever used that as an evidence to derive that fiqh ruling. So there's a difference between the mujtahidun, those at the higher levels of fiqh, the fuqaha, who derive and extrapolate from the evidences, the ahkam, compared to those who learn those ahkam and learn those evidences. So you may have a person who knows the fiqh rulings, and he knows the evidences for those fiqh rulings. Good. But then above him, you have the fuqaha and the mujtahidun who know the evidences, uh, who know the fiqh issues, and they know the evidences, and they were able to derive them and extrapolate them themselves too. So there's a difference between the levels the scholars mention in terms of these four sources of knowledge. And that's important to note, because Ahlul Bida'ah, one of the reasons they went astray was because of their attempt to get to some level that they are not at. Their attempt to extrapolate understandings and to work out and to deduct rulings that don't exist in the evidences they are looking at. Because they were not at the level of being able to do so. So it is important for a person to recognize the different levels. And in the books of Usul al-Fiqh, they have chapters explaining that. Who is a faqih? Who is a mujtahid? Who is this level, that level, this level? The various levels of that knowledge. Then he says, وَأَقْتَصِرُ عَلَى الْأَدِلَّةِ الْمَشْهُورَةِ He's already mentioned before that in this book he's going to mention the main fiqh issues only. The main things that people ask about. He's already told us that. Now he's telling us when he mentions those main fiqh topics, he is going to mention the most famous and easy evidences for them to make the book even easier rather than mentioning complicated evidences that people don't know and can't understand for the topics that he mentions he's going to mention the easy evidences for each one so that you can learn fiqh and you can learn the easy evidences for each one an easy ayah, an easy hadith, where the ruling can be taken from, simple evidences for the matters and the issues that will be mentioned. Khawfan min tatwil And one of the reasons for that, because he says, he feared that the book would basically become too long otherwise, if he started mentioning all of the other evidences and the long evidences, and the complicated evidences, he feared that it would become too long. وَإِذَا كَانَتِ الْمَسْأَلَةُ خِلَافِيَّةِ This is important because he's highlighting how he's going to teach you all of this book. How he's going to talk about the fiqh in this book. 
And it's important to know the methodology of a scholar when reading his book to benefit from it. He says, in the issues where there is a difference of opinion, some fiqh issues, you have differences of opinion in them. He says, the fiqh issues where there are differences of opinion, اِقْتَصَرْتُ عَلَى الْقَوْلِ الَّذِي تَرَجَّهَ عِنْدِي He says, in those issues where there's a difference, I suffice with the opinion that I believe to be the strongest. So there won't be a lot of differences of opinion in this book. There won't be the Maliki said this and the Hanafi said that and the Hanbali said that and the Shafi'i said that. It's not one of those types of books of fiqh. Those are the bigger books of fiqh. Here he says, where there's a difference of opinion, then I will just mention the opinion that I think is the strongest, just make it simple and give you that one opinion. The scholars have highlighted that this methodology in reality indicates that the shaykh is not muta'asib to any particular madhab. Because the reality is that this book, the basis of it, is the Hanbali fiqh. However, the fact that he says, when there's a difference of opinion, I will just mention the opinion that seems to be the strongest, shows that he's not just going to blindly be following the Hanbali fiqh, and every time there's a difference of opinion, he's just going to mention the Hanbali opinion. No. He says, where there are differences of opinion, I'll mention the one that I think is the strongest. And that's why the scholars, they say, this manhaj like that, is the same manhaj as Ibn Taymiyyah in fiqh. Same methodology as Ibn Taymiyyah in fiqh. He didn't just blindly give you one opinion, or one madhab, rather the opinion that looks the strongest, with the evidences, whether that is upon a particular madhab or not. This book is generally the Hanbali madhab, but that doesn't mean he blindly just gives you the Hanbali opinions. He gives you the opinions where the evidences are strongest. And that is the Salafi way. Taba'an lil adillati shar'iyya. He says he does that in following and keeping in line with the Islamic evidences. If the evidence indicates that such and such an opinion is the strongest, then even if it goes against the Hanbali madhab or other madhabs, he will follow that opinion and mention that opinion. Then, one other introduction, which is Al-Ahkam Khamsa. He says the rulings in Islam are five meaning all of the different acts of worship all of the different actions they come under five categories briefly the first one is wajib something obligatory the second one al haram something impermissible the third one, al makruh something disliked. We'll get to the exact definitions in a moment. The fourth one he mentions, al masnoon al mandub al mustahab, something liked and recommended. And the fifth one, al mubah, something which is neither recommended nor disliked. It is something allowed. Do it if you want. Don't do it. Allowed. So five things, when it comes to worship, your worship will fall under one of these five categories. Either, for example, the prayer. The prayer, the, uh, the five daily prayers. Do they come under the category of wajib, obligatory, or haram, or makruh, or mustahab, something recommended, or mubah? From those five, where does the prayer come? Wajib, the prayer comes under the wajib. Drinking alcohol, where does it come in the five? 
haram. Uh, entering the mosque with your right foot first. Where does it come? Masnoon, mustahab, recommended. So you see, all of the worships we do, all of the actions we do, they will come under one of five rulings. One of the five rulings. Either this action is obligatory, or this action is just mustahab, or this action is actually haram, or this action is actually just makruh. Or this action is nothing, it's mubah. You can do it if you want, leave it if you want, it's up to you. All actions are going to come under those five. So let's have a look at what these five are. In a little bit more detail. The first one, al-wajib. Al-wajib ma Well, here it says in the book, ma uthiba fa'iluhu. وَعُوقِبَ تَارِكُهُ The wajib is an action that the person who does it is rewarded and the one who abandons it is punished. That's the basic definition. We'll get to more details yet. The basic definition he mentions in the book is that a wajib is an action that the person who does it is rewarded for it, and the one who abandons it is punished. So prayer, for example, did we say that's wajib? Wajib. The person who does it, is he rewarded? Absolutely. The person who abandons it, is he punished? That's the basic definition. However, you should highlight in that definition... That it is the person ma'uthiba fa'iluhu imtithalan. The wajib action is the one that a person is rewarded for it if he does it for the sake of Allah. If he does it in implementation of the sunnah. As for somebody doing a wajib action for some other reason, not for the sake of Allah, then does that count? No. So to get the definition accurate, مَا أُثِيبَ فَاعِلُهُ إِمْتِثَالًا A wajib action is something where the person is rewarded for it. If they do it in implementation of the sunnah, in following the guidance and doing it for the sake of Allah. وَعُوقِبَ Or you could say, وَيَسْتَحِقُّ تَارِكُهُ قَصْدًا الْعِقَابِ Or, um, that's okay. Meaning, that a person who intentionally abandons a wajib action, a person who intentionally abandons a wajib action deserves to be punished. That's your full final definition of wajib. A wajib action in Islam is an action whereby the person who does it in implementation of the sunnah for the sake of Allah, is rewarded. And the one who abandons it intentionally, deserves to be punished. That's the full correct definition. Why do we say the person who abandons it intentionally? Because if a person abandoned it unintentionally, then he's not punished upon that. The prayer example we've been talking about now, the prayer is wajib. A person gets up every day for fajr and prays his prayer. One day, sleep overcomes him. Puts his alarm on everything as usual. But one day it just happens, maybe he's not feeling too well or something, sleep overcomes him and he gets up late. Is he now considered as the one who has abandoned an obligatory action? abandoned a wajib to be punished for it. He did not abandon it intentionally. 
He did not abandon it qasdan. So in that case, it is forgiven. And he makes up and prays that prayer when he wakes up. And that is for the one where it occurs out of his intention. As for the one who's lazy, that's another story. So the one who does it intentionally deserves to be punished. Because somebody may intentionally abandon a wajib action, but on Yawm al it's possible they may still be forgiven. Because they are going to be تحت المشيئة under the will of Allah. A person who committed sins and wrongs or abandoned obligatory actions on Yawm al he will be under the will of Allah. Maybe, maybe some people, they may still just be forgiven. That's why we say the definition of a wajib is the one who does it intentionally according to the sunnah for the sake of Allah is rewarded for it. And the one who abandons it intentionally deserves to be punished. Not that necessarily he will definitely be punished. That's why in the book where the Shaykh summarized, and he just said, وَعُوقِبَ تَارِكُهُ The one who abandons it is punished. He summarized and left it at that. But the reality of the meaning is, the one who abandons it on purpose, deserves to be punished. That is the full definition of the wajib. In terms of the, uh, uh, the language, Wajib in the Arabic language means something that is stuck to a particular position. Something that is stuck on a particular position. They say, for example, a per, uh, wajaba al insan or wajaba al mayyit. Wajaba al mayyit, what does that mean? The dead person has become wajib. What does that mean? They say, because when a dead person, someone dies and they fall down, then what's his body going to do now? Nothing. It's going to stay exactly where it fell. It will not move. It is stuck in that position now. They say about the camels, وَجَبَتْ جُنُوبُهَا When the camels are slaughtered and they fall down, what's going to happen now? Nothing. The body will just stay there. It's dead. It will not move. Stuck in that position. So linguistically, wajib comes from that meaning. Something which is stuck upon a particular position. Uh, you can also say, in regards to the wajib, that it is ma amara bihi ashari' ala wajhil ilzam. The wajib is something that Allah has commanded us with upon necessity. We've been commanded to pray the five daily prayers as an option or by necessity. Necessity, you must pray the five daily prayers. So a wajib in other words is an action that Allah has commanded us to do upon necessity. Not upon choice or option. You must do these actions. A command from Allah telling us you must do something is therefore an action that is wajib. So that is the wajib. Then after that, you have al-haram, the opposite. Al-haram, the opposite of the wajib. And that is basically therefore, something that Allah has commanded, or not commanded, prohibited. Something that Allah has prohibited us from by necessity. That you must abandon X, Y, and Z. A prohibition where Allah has told us you must abandon X, Y, and Z. Not an option, leave it if you want and do it if you want. No. Where Allah has commanded us or prohibited us and told us you cannot do X, Y, and Z, absolutely, then that action is considered a haram action, because Allah has prohibited us from it, upon a necessity, upon a must. 
As for al makruh that is ma uthiba. In fact, uh, for the definition of al haram, then that would be what then? Who are ma uthiba tarikuhu imtithalan wa yastahiku fa'iluhu qasdan al aqab. The opposite of your wajib definition. It is that a person, a person who abandons it in implementation of the sunnah, knows it's haram, so stops doing it, he is rewarded. And a person who does it intentionally, does it intentionally, is deserving of being punished. Because again, he may not necessarily be punished. He may be forgiven. So the one who commits a haram is the one who is rewarded for abandoning it. Imtithalan. Knowing it's a sunnah to abandon this haram. And the one who does it deserves. The one who does it intentionally. Qasdan. Deserves the punishment. And may not necessarily be punished. But deserves to be punished. al makruh what is the definition of al-makruh then? Like these definitions. The one who does it is deserving punishment. How would you explain that one? Al-makruh ma uthiba. The one who does it or leaves it is rewarded for the makruh. The one who leaves it. So ma uthiba tarikuhu imtithalan. Walam yu'aqab. Fa'iluhu. A makruh action is an action whereby the person who does it, imtithalan, is rewarded, uh, who abandons it. The one who abandons it, imtithalan, is rewarded. It's a makruh action. Disliked, he knows it's disliked in the sunnah, so he doesn't do it, he'll be rewarded. But the one who does it, lam yu'aqab. He will not be punished. You are not punished upon doing a makruh. But the one who leaves a makruh will be rewarded because he's leaving it knowing that the Quran and the Sunnah has made this affair a makruh, as we say, a disliked affair. So he leaves that affair implementing the Qur'an and the Sunnah to leave it. So he's rewarded. But it's not to the level of haram. So if somebody did end up doing it, it's not to be said that they are under the threat of punishment. Mandub, Masnoon, that will be the opposite then. The one who does it in accordance to the Sunnah, for the sake of Allah, a mandub, a mustahab, a masnoon action, he does it. It's not wajib for him to do it, but he knows it's a recommended action in the Quran and the Sunnah. So he does it for that reason, he will be rewarded. But the one who abandons it is not under the threat of punishment. Lam yu'aqab tariku. Because a sunnah action, a mandub action, a masnoon action, a mustahab action, it is not as though you are going to be under the threat of punishment if you abandon it. If a person walks in with his left foot instead of his right foot into the mosque, do we say he's now under the threat of punishment, he's committed a sin? No, because it is mustahab to come in with your right foot. But if a person doesn't and he comes in with his left foot, he's not under the threat of punishment for it. It's a mustahab action, not a wajib action to do. And the fifth one here is al-mubah. Al-mubah. Wa huwa alladhi fi'iluhu wa tarkuhu ala haddin sawa. The mubah is the action where doing it or not doing it in and of itself 
has no reward or punishment attached to it. Everyday actions, as you may call them, everyday things that you do, neither are you rewarded for it in and of itself, neither are you punished for it in and of itself. For example, eating. Generally, the action of eating, you can eat. Go and eat. It's not necessarily an action of reward in and of itself, and neither is it something to be punished upon if you eat. It can transfer. Mubah actions can transfer into other categories where you do get rewarded for them if you're doing them for an intention of some connection to worship. For example, eating and sleeping are generally considered mubah actions. But if you eat and sleep upon a particular routine, etc., in order to strengthen your body and to have energy and sufficient rest to be able to do your night prayer and other things, then maybe those actions of mubah have some reward associated to them. Because you're doing them for the sake of implementation of worship thereafter. So the mubah is normally something that in and of itself isn't an action of worship as such. There's no reward if you do it. There's no punishment if you leave it. Everyday things. But sometimes maybe you may be rewarded if it is done with a particular intention in mind. And the last thing the Sheikh mentions in the introduction here, وَيَجِبُ عَلَى الْمُكَلَّفِ فرض عين أن يتعلم منه فرض عين is extra it's not in the text أن يتعلم منه كل ما يحتاج إليه في عباداته ومعاملاته وإلها he says it is obligatory upon the مكلف the مكلف تكليف Meaning linguistically, a burden of responsibility upon you. Something that is a burden upon you is a taklif. Kallafa yukallifu taklif. The mukallaf, someone who has had some type of difficulty put on them. Some type of burden put on them. And what we mean here by the mukallaf Islamically, is a person who has had the burden of or the responsibility and the burden of implementing the rulings of Islam. A child, three-year-old, is the burden upon him that he must pray five prayers a day, he must go to Hajj right now, he must fast. Is it upon him that responsibility? No. But a person who's now beyond the age of puberty, that burden of responsibility is upon him. So, kallafa yukallifu, to put some burden upon a, a person, that is the mukallaf, the one who has the burden of responsibility placed upon their shoulders. So that is the one who reaches the age of puberty and there are the other signs. So, yajibu ala al-mukallaf, it is upon every person where the responsibility is upon them, they have reached the age of puberty, Fardain as an obligation upon everyone to learn fiqh to the level of what you require by necessity in your worships and your dealings and other than that. Meaning there is a minimum level of fiqh that everybody has to learn. A minimum level of fiqh that everybody has to learn. The fiqh of how to make wudu properly. Is that fard ayn or is it fard kifaya? Fard ayn that everybody has to do it, fard kifaya. As long as some people do it, the rest don't have to do it. Learning about the fiqh of wudu and prayer. Which of the types is it? Fard ayn. Every person has to learn the fiqh of how to make wudu and how to pray. Because every person has to. Make wudu and pray every day. You cannot go without that knowledge. You have to have the knowledge of how to make wudu properly. If you don't, you're going to spend all of your life maybe making wudu wrong. 
and the prayer, maybe spend all of your life praying wrong. So there is a minimum level of fiqh that every person must learn. And the Shaykh concludes with an evidence here. Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Man yuridillahu bihi khayra yufaqqihu fiddin. That whomsoever Allah wants goodness for, then Allah gives that person knowledge and understanding in the religion. Knowledge and understanding of the religion, a sign of goodness for a person. A sign that Allah wants goodness for an individual. And that's why Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned that jahl is a sign of a lack of goodness. Because if knowledge is a sign of goodness for a person, then jahl must be a sign of a lack of goodness for that person. So it is in the hadith highlighting the virtue of knowledge the virtue of learning this fiqh in order that you can then worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accurately and properly. How many people they get to the age of 30, 40, 50 and still when you ask them, they are not able to explain how to make wudu properly. They are not able to explain how to pray properly. You see them and they are still making mistakes. That's why it is so important to learn fiqh in the religion so that you are performing your worship in the accurate manner according to the sunnah because actions are only accepted upon sincerity and in following the sunnah that they are in accordance to how the messenger taught us. So that is the introduction to this book. After that, from the next time, insha'Allah ta'ala, we'll begin with the first chapter in the book. The first chapter, which is Kitab al-Tahara. There's a brief introduction onto Kitab al-Tahara as well that we'll mention very briefly. And then it goes on into the actual core of the fiqh. And the first topic that it mentions is about water. Because... Imagine a person learns how to make wudu 100% accurately. They learn how to make wudu 100% according to the sunnah. But then they're out in the jungle or out somewhere in the wilderness and they come across some water and it looks a bit dirty. Is it allowed to use that water to make their wudu or not? So now there's a problem. That person may know 100% how to make the wudu, but now he's stuck, he doesn't know which type of water he's allowed to use to make his wudu. That's why in the books of fiqh, the scholars don't begin with wudu first, they begin with water, explaining to you the different types of water. If you come across some water in a stream, in a pond, in a puddle, in a lake, which, which one of these waters can you use? Can you use all of these different types of water to make wudu with? No. The sea water, the ocean water, the lakes, the rivers, different types of water you come across. Which types of water are allowed for wudu and which types are not allowed? That's going to be the first topic which we'll begin with inshallah ta'ala in two weeks time. As you know, this lesson is every fortnight every two weeks and every other Friday is the other class, the other topic. This will be every two weeks then, inshallah ta'ala. We'll resume with that, start with that section from the next session in two weeks. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Any questions or anything up to there? Um, in order to be rewarded for avoiding a haram action, would a person need to know that that action is haram and intentionally avoid it? If you just didn't do it by chance. That's the intention of the definition. Yeah. To be rewarded upon an action, you have to have the intention. Every action of worship requires an intention. So if a person simply did not know something is haram, but just the way he is, he had no desire to do that anyway, didn't do it. Not because he knew it was haram. He didn't even know it was haram, he just didn't do it. And that's different compared to someone who knows it's haram and abandons it knowing it's haram, 
He's not doing it with that sincere intention for the sake of Allah and abandoning that action. So there's certainly a difference. Um, you said that Mubarak can be uh, transferred into something that's rewardable. Can it also be transferred into something that's punishable? For example, you might eat too much. You might not be able to pray. Possibly certain actions that are Mubah, they could end up as haram even. Certain actions that are mubah, the way that you do it and how you do it and what you perform with those certain actions, it could lead to something, lead on to or open up doors to something which is makruh or something that is impermissible. That's why they say a mubah is something that in and of itself isn't rewarded or punished. But when you take it out of in and of itself, and you connect it to other things, then maybe it could be something rewarded, and maybe it might end up something on the other side. Examples of makruh, there could be so many different things, but the makruh, it's not really a list you can go through, but the easier way to do it would be that when you go through the chapters, there are certain, like when you get to the chapter of the prayer. Within the prayer, there are certain actions that are wajib, and, and there are pillars, and there are sunnah mustahab actions, and there are makruh actions in the prayer. So when we get to the topic of the prayer, we'll mention the makruh actions of the prayer. When you get to the topics of fasting and hajj and other things, all of those worships, there may be certain actions within them that are considered makruh. So as you go through the chapters, we'll mention what is mustahab, what is wajib, because that's the point. When he goes through the fiqh, he's going to be telling you which of these actions are wajib and what's mustahab and what's uh, mandub, uh, makruh and uh, haram. When he goes through the fiqh, he's going to be breaking down the rulings of everything. So as you go through, you will come across certain aspects of worship where the ruling he mentions upon it is makru. So that's the way we have to do it. Otherwise, just sitting here giving a list wouldn't really work. But we'll do that as we go through the book, inshallah. Uh, the terminology of makruh as haram, it's definitely in aqidah. In aqidah, when the salaf used to say something is makruh, talking about an issue of aqidah, that if you do X, Y, and Z, that's a makruh thing to do. In aqidah topics, they meant by makruh, haram. They meant by makruh, haram, in aqidah things. But in fiqh, uh, it differs over the different madhahib and their definitions, the Hanafiya especially, they have a few different definitions compared to these five. But that thing about makruh meaning haram in aqidah definitely. But in fiqh it will depend on the different methodologies. Anybody else? How is ijma' Uh-huh. So for example, in this room now we have all these people. And we're talking about a particular topic where there's a difference of opinion on it. Any topic where there's... Uh, do you put your hands on your chest after you come out of the rukur, Or do you put them down by your side? If I was to now say there is a consensus of Masjid al-Sunnah in Bradford that you put them down by your side after the rukur, For me to claim that, I need to basically go through every person and ask them what's your opinion. But did any scholar ever do that? Did they go through every scholar and check every scholar to see what their opinion is? Because for me to say there's a consensus here, that you leave your hands down by your side, I would really need to go through every single person and ask them, do you agree that it's down by your side? If everybody said yes to me, once I've gone through everybody, then I could say definitely there's a consensus. But obviously I'm not going to do that. And scholars 
when they say there's a consensus upon something, have they gone through every single scholar of the past, every single one, and some of the scholars of the past, their books may not even be preserved, etc. So how can they claim there's a consensus when they haven't done a proper analysis of every single scholar? It's a point. And that's why some of them say, in reality, there is nothing, there is no mas'ala where there is a 100% consensus on it. Because of this, they say, some of them, it is impossible to claim consensus on any given mas'ala. Because how are you going to make the analysis? How are you going to find every single opinion, every single scholar? And there may well be some scholars who disagree. You're never going to find an issue where every single scholar had the same opinion. And so some of them say there's no such thing as an absolute consensus upon a mas'ala from the mas'ala. But when they say there's a consensus, and they say often, then obviously they are referring to the general masses of what they have come across, that they do not know of anybody who opposes the opinion, or that the ones who oppose it, their opposition is غير معتبر, as they say. That their opposition is not worthy of consideration. For example, here now, everybody says that you put your hands down by your side. Because, for example... For example, everybody in this room attended, uh, like a few years ago, we did the Prophet's prayer described in this mosque. Let's imagine everybody in this mosque attended that course when we did the Prophet's prayer described, but one person here didn't attend it. So now everybody here has the opinion, you put, put your hands down by your side, but this one person says you put them on your chest. We say, khalas, you stay quiet. You weren't even at the class. You don't even know what you're talking about. We're not even going to consider you. Wipe him out and everybody else is a consensus. Sometimes the scholars, they say that a, an opposition of some people is not considered an opposition. Normally, normally they say that for Ahlul Bid'ah. Normally that's what it's used for. Because Ahlul Bid'ah, they may oppose Ahlul Sunnah in a particular affair. But Ahlul Sunnah will say we have consensus regardless of the opposition of Ahlul Bid'ah, because their opposition is not given any weight. So sometimes scholars may use that argument, they say there's consensus, because X, Y, and Z who opposed this consensus, his statement is not of any weight. But uh, that topic as well, it's Usul al-Fiqh. In Usul al-Fiqh, they'll talk about that in whole chapters about Ijma' and how you work it out, and all these different statements of the scholars and some of them saying there's no such thing as an absolute ijma'ah. Anything else? Uh, what is the ruling on someone who is not allowed to pray in the masjid? Is it haram? Eating an apple? So somebody who does an action or doesn't do an action, doesn't do it or does it? Okay, so somebody who does an action thinking that it's actually haram. So they actually think they are doing a sin. They actually think they are doing a sin. But it's not actually a sin. What they are doing isn't actually haram. But they thought it was haram. And when they did it, they believed they were doing something haram. They believed they were sinning. But it turns out, actually, that wasn't even a sin. So what's the ruling on that person? Without a doubt, there will be something of a negative ruling upon the person. He, in his intention, in his intention, is disobeying Allah. He is performing an action, which, regardless of the action, eating an apple or whatever, regardless of it, he is doing an action, whereby he believes right now he is sinning against Allah. So that is certainly something negative upon that person. Whether you can write it down, whether the angels write it as a sin upon him in those affairs, you can look into the fatawa and details, we'll have to research into that. But as for the person, no doubt that is a negative mark upon that person. He believes he's sinning against Allah. And if he believes he's sinning against Allah, even though it turns out he wasn't, then that belief and that action will certainly end up leading to 
other actions where he continues sinning against Allah, and they are haram actions. So no doubt it's something negative upon that person to have fallen into this situation, and he should, in general terms, repent from intending to disobey Allah, and to ensure that he sticks to the commandments. Anybody else? In that case, we'll conclude upon that then. So like we said in two weeks' time, we'll start with the first chapter, which talks about the type of water you can use for wudu, and then the actual uh, wudu and purification from that. Insha'Allah ta'ala. What time is prayer? Huh? No? Okay.